Did you know that the leader of the synagogue knew that he was going to bring in a man with a withered hand and see what Jesus would do? It was meant to be a trap. The same leader of the synagogue and others who were there in that synagogue, when Jesus cast out a demon who erupted during their prayer time, when he cast out that demon, they accused Jesus of being a follower of Satan and doing it with the power of Beelzebub. There were critics who wanted Jesus' life, and eventually they would see him die. They thought they did it. <laughs> no, God laid down his life. But there were critics who stood in opposition to him. And what does Jesus do with the critics? What would he do with somebody who calls the sheriff on you simply because you're a follower of Jesus Christ and out there with a concert? What would he do? Oh, I'm sure he'd get angry and mad and throw stones at them, right? Mm -mm. Not our Jesus. Not our Jesus. Because Jesus understands that even critics have needs. Even critics, even those who may be in the greatest opposition to you and to Christ, they have pain, they have hurt and heartaches, they have needs that only Jesus Christ can meet. <clears throat> I want to remind you, and we passed the slide already, I want to remind you that we are going through the Gospel of Mark with a purpose, and that purpose to understand what it means to be a disciple, a follower of Jesus Christ. And Jesus, throughout the Gospel of Mark, really is training the disciples. We're going to see that again today, as he's getting these disciples ready for their responsibility once he leaves and goes to heaven. They're going to be the ones who are going to pass the gospel to all the nations, across the land, to the entire world. And we join with them, yes? Might I warn you that if we are not doing the work of a disciple, then we're just doing busy work. And that includes anything you do that you say, oh, this is for God. I'm going and I'm eating ice cream for God. I'm go going to work for God so that I can have money to buy that new car. Whatever it is. You know, if, if it's not about the Great Commission, it's simply busy work. And the disciples were being prepared like you and I are being prepared for ministry in our day to care about people, to show them the love of Jesus Christ, to help them become what? Critics? No. <laughs> to help them become followers of Jesus Christ. Fully devoted men and women of God who are going to then take what Jesus has given to them and pass it on to others. <clears throat> so he says, go and make disciples. Even if people criticize you. Which is interesting, and I'm just going to have to do this one parenthesis. I apologize. But it's interesting. But one of the reasons why we don't share Jesus is because we're afraid of the criticism. You think about it. Any way you cut it, well, I'm afraid what they'll say. I'm afraid they'll reject me. I'm afraid they won't like it. I'm afraid what? What? I don't know it. If you know that Jesus loves the world so much that he died on the cross, that whoever believes in him will not die, but will have everlasting life. You know everything you need to know to tell somebody else about Christ. That's all you need to know. So don't wait for somehow, I have to know more. It's frankly fear of their criticism that's keeping you and us from sharing Jesus Christ. So we're supposed to go, <coughs> excuse me, and make disciples. People may disagree with you. In fact, they probably will. People don't like it when they think that you might be pointing out something in their life that is sin. And the problem is, if you're not sinning with them, you're going to make them feel uncomfortable. And it's a form in which they're going to think you're judging them. You don't, you're not thinking about it at all. You might not even be noticing that they're sinning, and yet... Because you're not doing what they're doing, they're going to think, oh, you're judging me. You're criticizing me. You're, you're, you're saying I'm bad. No, I'm bad. I sin. 
I fall short of the glory of God, but I found somebody who died for my sins to set me free from them, and I'd love to introduce him to you if you want to know him. Amen. They may disagree, but when they're hurting, who will they turn to? Because if they believe you have faith, if they've seen faith in you, and they know you, guess who they'll turn to? You. Mark 5, 21 to 24. <clears throat> If I was going to summarize what else I'm going to say today in this message, it's that we need to watch for opportunities to minister to people when they are in need. We'll win people through caring and love rather than through judgment. However, folks, this doesn't mean that you forget, that you forget the values that God has given to you in his word, that you say, well, they don't matter. It's okay. We're no longer going to call that sin a sin. It doesn't mean that at all. But what it means is that you're going to have love be your highest value, your motivating value, the value that causes you to reach out even though they criticize you. Mark 5, 21 to 24. When Jesus had again crossed over by boat to the other side of the lake, a large crowd gathered around him while he was by the lake. Then one of the synagogue rulers named Jairus came there. Seeing Jesus, he fell at his feet and pleaded earnestly with him. My little daughter is dying. Please come and put your hands on her so she will be healed and live. So Jesus went with him. The ruler of the synagogue pleads with Jesus. It's an interesting character, isn't he? The ruler of the synagogue was more than an office manager, more than a secretary. He was the man who controlled the spiritual activities that took place in the synagogue. What was the synagogue? The synagogue was a place of prayer. And the, the synagogue leaders controlled all the activities that took place in this place of prayer. It wasn't the temple, so it wasn't the holy of holy places, yet it was a place of prayer. And as long as the temple was in Jerusalem, you would build a synagogue and you'd point that synagogue towards Jerusalem to remind you that that's where God's holy of holy places is. I think I have a picture for you. Okay, oh wow, that's really small. Well, you can see sort of there that that's a a, a drawing of the um, synagogue in Capernaum. Next slide, please. The synagogue in Capernaum, still, there's still walls that stand, and some of them have been re-erected. This is the, Capernaum, the synagogue in Capernaum. This particular part of that synagogue was probably built around 3, 4, 500 A.D. However, they have found within the ruins of this synagogue the synagogue that would have been there when Jesus was there. This is the very site where Jesus spoke and taught, where Jesus cast out the demon of the man, healed the withered hand. This is where the synagogue leader served. But this is an interesting man because this synagogue leader, though he has been committed to Judaism, his daughter is sick. She's dying. And he recognizes how serious it is. And he must have gone through quite a battle. You have to just wonder what's happening. Would you, if you were married, leave your wife with your daughter if she's just about to die? You'd be probably there distraught trying to help her. And yet this man says, the only thing I can do, I've got, he's desperate. And he runs and he finds Jesus who happens to have just come back across the lake again. And there's a crowd around him. And he gets and he falls down on his knees. Imagine this. The synagogue leader, he will totally lose his position in that synagogue for what he's about to do. There is no shame in him. There is no holding back. He runs to the feet of Jesus, kneels down in front of him, and he pleads with him. This is Jesus, the one that has been accused of being demonic himself the one who's been accused of ruining the Sabbath and going against God. But this Sabbath leader knows within Jesus there's something special. It's interesting. He comes alone. Why? 
Could it have been that the other friends that were there with him tried to talk him out of it? What are you thinking? Jairus, you're the leader of the synagogue. You honor God here. If you go to Jesus, you're going to lose that position. Don't go. Don't go, Jairus. No, I, I, I have to go. I have to go because my daughter is dying. Incidentally, another little note about this daughter. When the word says that she's how old? You'll see it later. She's 12 years old. 12 years old in one day, and you become a woman or a man. 13 years old on your birthday. You become a man, an adult. And yet she's referred to as a little girl. And for dad, she is his little girl, isn't she? precious to him and and he's thinking we're going to lose her just before she becomes an adult I can't lose this little girl she's sick and dying mom's probably desperately pleading with her husband Jairus do something you're the leader of the synagogue surely you must have some kind of power with God do something Jairus he says I know what I'm going to do because I've seen the one who I think can help her, the only one I can go to. And he runs to him and falls on his knees and he begs Jesus, please, please heal my daughter. Now, Jesus does what? Jesus says, okay, let's go. And a whole crowd is there with them. And so the whole crowd starts heading for Jairus' house. And, and on the way, he's so, so crowded that, the, and there's another story, and we're not going to read it this morning. We're going to do it next week because there's a miracle happens on the way to a healing. Well, that's the title of next week's message, okay? But just to give you the quick parentheses, this woman who's been bleeding for 12 years, interesting, same age, the daughter's 12 years old. This lady's been bleeding for 12 years, unclean. This little daughter is pure and special. And, and here's a lady that's untouchable even to her husband. And, and she comes up and says, okay, I can't get close enough to really do anything. I can't really talk to this man because I'm unclean. Can't let him know that I got there. But if I can just touch the hem of his garment, I'm going to be healed. I just, I'm just certain of it because this man is special. And she goes up and she touches the hem. And, she, and then all of a sudden Jesus says, who touched me? <laughs> well, that's another story. So we're going to come back to it. But I just want you to know that right after he's healed her and she's come and talk to him, What happens? Look at the next verse. Jump down to verse 35. While Jesus was still speaking, while he was still talking with the woman, after having just said, you're forgiven, you've been set free, while he's still talking to her, some people came from the house of Jairus, the synagogue leader, and what did they say? Jairus, your daughter's dead. Why bother the teacher anymore? I need you to get the flavor for this. This is like insensitive, uncaring. Jairus, she's dead. Forget the master. Forget, the, they only call him master. Forget the teacher. Quit bothering him. Oh my goodness. Can you imagine? These are not really uh, loving people, aren't they? She's dead, Jairus. Mean her on you. You shouldn't have come to Jesus. That's almost the attitude. I mean, imagine. You're with this crowd. You've gone to a man that you believe is the doctor, the physician, the great healer, that the only one that you think is left that can do something for your daughter. And then these people who are supposed to have your interests in mind as well as your daughter's come, she's dead. Leave the guy alone. Quit bugging him. Come on, told you not to come to him anyways. Now it's in that context, with that kind of attitude, she's dead. What does Jesus do? Well, the, 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 the verse that we have, is, it says, overhearing what they said in verse 36, <clears throat> Jesus told him, don't be afraid, just believe. Now, Paul's right there. Overhearing what they said. What the word actually is there is, <laughs> ignoring what they said. He turns to Jairus, deciding, I'm not going to listen to what they're saying. And he wants Jairus not to listen as well. He says, Jairus, don't be afraid, just believe. Jairus, don't be afraid, just believe. Jairus, don't be afraid, just believe. 
And you need to know that one of the reasons why maybe the woman was healed just before this is because Jairus has just seen her healed. Jairus has just seen what Jesus has done with this woman with her bleeding problem. And it's meant to spur Jairus on to faith as well. Jairus, ignore them. Don't listen. Don't be afraid she's gone, Jairus. Just believe. Now, how many times have we been in a situation where the fear is gripping us, the emotion is hurting us, the, the stress is causing us to be overwhelmed? And what is Jesus saying? Don't be afraid. Just believe. I love what God does in moments like that. How he'll give us something that will give us more encouragement. He may, he may have somebody call us up and share a story with us that's meant to give us faith so we'll not be afraid but believe. We may re be reminded of a prayer request that, oh my, God answered that prayer. Don't be afraid, just believe. We may see somebody that literally we can see them be a different person because Jesus Christ has come into them. And Jesus says, don't be afraid. Just believe. We may be going into the doctor that we're scared that he's going to say something bad to us. And the doctor says, can I pray with you? And Jesus is trying to say, don't be afraid. Just believe. We, we may be in the store and somebody out of the blue says, you know what, God just said to, to tell you, don't be afraid. Just believe. The soldiers were out there yesterday and you know what they were also doing? Praying for people. <laughs> Praying for people. Because Jesus wants us to know, don't be afraid. Just believe. <clears throat> Verse 38, when they came to the home of the synagogue leader, and by the way, I skipped a part of verse 36 and 37 where it said, Jesus says he only takes a couple people with him, Peter, James, and John, the, the, the three that are closest to him, that, that special little group of disciples, the inner circle of disciples, if you will, Peter who becomes the leader of the apostles, and James and John, the, and, and he brings them, just those guys along, along with Jairus. In fact, he makes the crowd stay here. The other disciples kind of put up their shoulders, I'm sure, like soldiers would and keep the rest of the crowd away. And just these five head on, is that five? Anyways, just this group head, heads on to go see Jairus' daughter. Verse 38, when they came to the home of the synagogue leader, Jesus saw a commotion with people crying and wailing loudly. He went in and said to them, why all this commotion and wailing? The child is not dead but asleep. But they laughed at him. After he put them all out, he took the child's father and mother and the disciples who were with, were with him and went in where the child was. Folks, do you understand what it was like at a funeral of somebody who died? Immediately upon word that somebody has died, people start wailing. When you hear somebody wailing, oh, somebody just died. If you're a neighbor, you go over and you start wailing too. Oh, oh, and it just goes on and on. And in fact, if you were, had a flute, you brought your flute with you also. So some of the people that would go there would be all, oh, 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 oh and going on and on. And in fact, pretty soon, the, the professional wailers would come. Okay, within moments, they knew their job. They'd been trained well, and so they'd get there and then, oh, so now you're getting this large group of people and then each one who's also coming with a flute starts playing their own dirge. And they're all playing different tunes and it's a cacophony. That means it's a whole bunch of noise. And the noise is going on and on and Jesus comes in and he says, well, how does he describe it? There's a commotion going on. And he says, you guys be quiet. She's just sleeping. And how do they all respond? Folks, this is amazing. They move from wailing to cynical laughter in a moment like that. Oh! What? <laughs> These are not people who really care about this girl going on. You need to understand that the wailing was meant to say, look how terrible death is. Death is a victor. Death is an enemy. Then we can't defeat it. And this girl's gone. Oh! 
sleep. Ah! How do you do that? <laughs> now, I understand, and, and, I, and, and you've seen, all just seen this at the funeral, right? Somebody's talking, and they're sharing about their loved one, and, and pretty soon they're in tears. And as they continue to converse, somebody says, but do, do you remember what she did last week? It was so funny. And you start to laugh. And, and you're standing there laughing because of it. And, and all of a sudden, it, it suddenly moves back to tears. Now, understand that can happen naturally, yes? And, and, and the emotion's got to get out. Whether you're, whether you're going to let it out or not, emotion has to get out. And when you're grieving, you're hurting. But these people aren't just grieving. These people are simply professional noisemakers. And Jesus says, well, this is a commotion? And y'all need to be quiet because the girl's asleep. You might wake her. Well, he doesn't say that, but he does say she's sleeping. And so he, he says, be quiet. And they start laughing at him. And this is not a laugh like, you know, oh, yeah, I remember that story. No, this is a laugh. Ha, 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 you fool. You dummy. Who do you think you are? We know when the girl's dead and she's dead and you're dumb. I mean, yeah, I, folks, you don't think they're thinking that kind of attitude, little stuff about Jesus when he's walking in there and telling them she's not dead, she's sleeping. You're like, you're crazy, man. We knew you were weird. That's why we told Jairus not to go to you. That's why we were offended when he did. And we're glad, in fact, that she's dead to prove you're nothing. He says, get out of here. By the way, it's not very nice. Kind of like he told the, the men in, in the temple who were selling things, cheating people, ripping them off. And he says, this is a house of prayer. And what does he, he do? Turns over the table and says, get out of here. Get out of my father's house. And the same thing he says to these people, get out of this house. And I don't want any wailers. I don't want any of this noise. Get out of here. And he takes Peter and James and John, and Jairus, and Jairus' wife, and he says, let's go in and see the little girl. And he walks into the room where the little girl is. <clears throat> I, by the way, I probably should have pointed this out also. There were 39 rules for what to do in how you rip your clothing when somebody dies. 39 rules on the way to rip your clothing. This shirt's fairly new, so I'm not going to show you, but, okay. No. <laughs> you had to rip it over the heart. You basically ripped it enough just to uncover the heart. Now, if you were a girl, then you, had to, you would turn your clothing around, and so the ripped part would be in the back. If you were a guy, you didn't care what you showed, okay? You'd also maybe have underwear under there, or uh, actually the undergarment that would be on there, there so you didn't totally uh, uh, protect you. However, you were supposed to rip that too, because you're supposed to rip it deep to the heart. Your pain is hurting you all the way inside, and you gotta rip it. And now, if you and you had to keep that ripped clothing on for 30 days. So if you're a professional whaler and you're invited, well, you're not invited, you just go on your own accord because you know it's your job. You arrive there, what did you wear? Not your Sabbath best. You wore old clothing and you would rip it across the heart and because you're grieving and mourning and wounded and sad and, and, and you're going on about that and you're wailing on about it. And you do that for 30 days. Now you could stitch it up a little bit, but it still had to be obvious that it was torn for that entire 30 days. At the end of 30 days, then you could wear your new clothes again. Jesus comes into this commotion, sends them away, and he goes into the room with mom and dad. Now how do you think mom and dad are feeling? I mean. Mom's been there the whole time dad left. Dad didn't even see what happened to her. And Jesus walks into the room. And what does he do? He takes her hand. He takes her hand. And he speaks to her. And he says, Talitha kum. It's interesting, Mark is the one writer, and the other Gospels have recorded this account too, but Mark's the one who records the Aramaic, the language that Jesus spoke. Talitha kum, which means, little girl, I say to you, get up. Even a more literal translation means little lamb. 
little lamb, innocent child, tender little thing, get up. <clears throat> Immediately the girl stood up and began to walk around. She was 12 years old. At this they were completely astonished. He gave strict orders not to let anyone know about this and told them to give her something to eat. <clears throat> little lamb. You see the love of Jesus? You know, Jesus could have, could have easily said, Jairus, head on back home, she's healed. Couldn't he? I mean, doesn't? Does he need to be there? No, he can do that. He'll do it. In other cases, he'll do that. He doesn't need to go. Why does he go? Jesus goes to show his tenderness to this little girl, to show his love to this family. And so he touches her hand, he reaches down for her, he says, Talitha kum, little girl, get up. Little girl, rise. <clears throat> and then he, he makes this interesting statement. He says, he, in fact, he orders them, don't tell anyone else about this. Don't, don't, don't let anybody know. What, why, yeah, anybody got an idea on that one? Wouldn't it be kind of a, I mean, how could, the girl, for, as far as everyone else is concerned, she died, right? So if he goes back out, well, she's not dead, or she's alive now, and if they go out talking, what's going to happen? There's some variety of things that could have happened. For one, the people have already tried to take Jesus as, mas, as the king, and Jesus does not want to be the king the way the people understand it. I think there's something else going on, because what's the other thing that he says to the little girl? He says, get up. Don't tell anybody about this. Instead, go get her something to eat. She doesn't need a whole bunch of people in the room right now. She doesn't need a bunch of people wailing on her, getting all over her and everything. She just needs some peace. So mom, dad, enjoy your little girl. And don't talk about this to anybody because, you know, like I told them out there, she's not dead. She's sleeping. So they're not going to talk about this miracle, maybe. <laughs> they're just supposed to enjoy the miracle that Jesus has done for them. One of the things that we need to learn from this story is that even critics have needs. Even the synagogue ruler who may be in opposition to you has personal needs and we can help meet them through the power of Jesus Christ. Sometimes folks, we need to ignore what people are saying about Jesus and simply show them God's love. We need to refuse to listen to the negative things that people are saying about God. And we're in a culture that's growing in its opposition to Christianity. Don't listen. We need to ignore the naysayers. God's not. And sometimes that voice may even be in our own head. Oh, God doesn't care. He's not going to do anything to meet this person's need. We need to listen to those things that are being revealed to us by God himself. Don't be afraid, just believe. Don't be afraid, just believe. Don't be afraid, Jairus, just believe. We need to be prepared to minister to people when they're hurting and they're around you. Watch for them. Look for the opportunities. Pray for opportunities to serve people around you who don't know Jesus, but you pray for the opportunity to serve them. And folks, pray for the opportunity to pray with them. Don't be afraid. Just believe. If you pray for somebody who's in trouble, hurting, struggling, f desperate, will God listen to you? See, here's the interesting thing. Sometimes the people who don't believe have more faith in your prayers than you do. Did you hear that? Sometimes the people who don't believe in God have more faith in your prayers than you do. Don't be afraid, just believe. Be ready to pray and pray with them. If somebody says, would you please pray? I'm going to the doctor. Would you please pray for me? I know you're a praying person, so would you please pray for me? What should you do? 
got it. It's on my prayer list tomorrow morning, 6 a.m. I'm on my knees for you, baby. I'm going to pray. Yes, right? Well, sure, you should do that. But not just that. If they're standing there with you or they're talking to you on the phone, what you should do is immediately say, yes, let's pray. And don't wait for them to say, no, you don't need to. (laughs) Start praying. Start praying. And don't worry about how you pray. Well, I don't have enough King James language, so I'm not sure God's going to hear. God didn't speak King James, okay? Jesus spoke Aramaic. So, if it, yeah, so you don't need to worry about how it sounds. Well, I might not be eloquent. Well, it, it just might, I, 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 it might stutter even. Oh, so what? You're not performing. You're talking to the God of heaven and earth who cares about this person and has given you an opportunity to link the two together. So pray. Watch for those opportunities. <clears throat> There's something else we need to get from this message. Not only do we need to be ready to meet those needs and ready to pray, but you and I need to remember something. This story is evidence that Jesus Christ conquers death. The last enemy that will be destroyed is what? Death. It's described in passages like 1 Corinthians as if there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless and so is your faith. More than that, we are then found to be false witnesses about God, for we have testified about God that he raised Christ from the dead. Have you ever said that? But he did not raise him if in fact the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, then Christ has not been raised either. Then if Christ has not been raised, then your faith is futile. You are still in your sins. Then those also who have fallen asleep in Christ are lost. If only for this life we have hope in Christ, we are of all people most to be pitied. And it would be sad if Paul stopped 1 Corinthians 15 at that verse. But verse 20 continues. But Christ has indeed been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since death came through a man, the resurrection of the dead comes also through a man. For as in Adam all die, so in Christ all will be made alive. But each in turn, Christ the first fruits. Then when he comes, those who belong to him. Then the end will come when he hands over the kingdom to God the Father after he has destroyed all dominion, authority, and power. For he must reign until he has put all his enemies under under his feet, and the last enemy to be destroyed is death. And that's part of this story. Jesus saying, look, Peter, James, John, you saw me calm the storm and you were afraid. You saw me stop the wind and it terrified you. You saw me control the demons, thousands of them resonant in this man, and you were afraid. But gentlemen, take note, I have authority over death. And the last enemy will be destroyed. And if you look in Revelation, what does it say? Then again, verse 14, death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. The lake of fire is the second death. And the enemy is destroyed. Do you remember why we do communion? Paul said we're supposed to do something. That as often as we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim what? The Lord's death. Until when? Until he comes again. Until Jesus comes back, he invites us, proclaim his death. Talk about it. Remember it. His body was broken. His blood was shed in order to pay the price of sin and to purchase heaven for all who would believe. Proclaim his death 
until he comes again. And this morning, we're invited to do that again. And who should we be proclaiming his death to? To anyone who's afraid of dying. Are you ready? Are you ready to remember? Are you ready to see Jesus? And are the people that you know ready for Christ to come back? If not, start serving. Because even critics need Jesus. Father God, come. Bless what we're doing, going to do here at this table as we remember your body broken for us, your blood shed for us. Jesus, please don't let us be complacent at this moment.